Okay, cool. We are live. This is uh, awesome. Welcome to the interview here. I've got uh, Dr. Penny Kendall Reed with me here. She is uh, an expert in nutrigenomics, uh, nutrition, uh, uh, in relation to genetics. Um, Officially, uh, Penny, Dr. Penny Kendall-Reed is a naturopathic doctor in Toronto. After graduating from McGill University in neurobiology, she earned a degree in naturopathic medicine from the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, where she received the Dr. Alan Tyler Award for Most Outstanding Clinician. In 2013, she was voted naturopath of the year by her peers and colleagues, and just has been nominated for top international naturopathic doctor. Penny Kendall-Reed is the author of five national best-selling books, uh, which I'm excited for her to tell you why she does not carry those anymore in her <laughs> office, uh, including the naturopathic diet, healing arthritis, the no crave diet, the complete doctor's stress solution, and the complete doctor's back Bible. Dr. Kendall Reed travels worldwide lecturing on the following topics, genetics, how to interpret and treat single nucleotide polymorphism, SNPs as we like to call them, uh, neuroendocrine disorders, and metabolic related diseases. She appears regularly on television, magazine, and radio across Canada and the United States addressing various health issues and is a monthly health expert expert for several magazines including Health and Wellness Magazine and Best Health. Dr. Kendall Reed analyzes and interprets genetic profiles and uses them to design personalized health programs for patients worldwide. Dr. Penny Kendall Reed, welcome to the Holistic A-Hole podcast. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Uh, I'm so excited for this interview. I've been Thinking about this a lot, um, I saw you speak at a uh, workshop here in New York City discussing uh, nutrigenomics, and I've tried to talk about nutrigenomics on this podcast. Um, it's a little, uh, it's a little above my pay grade, but I find it to be so interesting. And personally, I feel that you know, as as healthcare changes in the world, especially in the United States probably in Canada as well, um, you know, people are erring more and more to like a holistic health-based approach. Um, but I also find this, this kind of intertwining, this uh, cross-section into genetics and understanding your own personal genetics is probably the most important part of that. So I was hoping maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Absolutely. You're, you're exactly right. I mean, we are starting now to define at, at such an individual basis what each person needs. You know, we, we've seen it for a long period of time. One, one patient will react really well with, say, a medication for blood pressure, and another individual who looks like they have similar profile, they don't react at all to that drug. And we've always scratched our heads for so many years going, why isn't this working? Why isn't this a panacea drug for everything? And we're now seeing that there's individuality in everything. How we absorb a nutrient. Do we then take that nutrient and put it into a target tissue? How we break down a hormone. How many hormones do we make? How does our body process a drug or a medication? It is all individualized now. And this is what makes me so excited about genetics. For so long, I sat there in my practice going, well, why doesn't this diet work for everybody? And, and as you say, I've, I've written five books. They've all done extremely well, but I don't carry any of them anymore because there isn't a cookie cutter formula. So I wrote them quite a while ago, many, several years ago, and that was when we didn't have genetics. So I thought, well, yeah, this, this style of diet will manipulate these hormones and that should have a beneficial effect on someone's metabolism. Not so much anymore. And this is why we see row after row after row of books in Barnes and Nobles, um, because everybody's coming out with a new book because the previous book didn't work for everybody, which is why now I'm actually writing a book on genetics that the, the public can actually use and personalize to themselves. And we know that genetics, it actually counts for 40 to 70% of variation in our body weight, independent of diet and exercise. That's huge. So there are some people that unless we manipulate their hormones because of their genetics, they're never ever going to lose the weight, decrease the inflammation, or become healthy. Well, this is the thing that as I get more into, into the health world that I, I'm really trying to understand and emphasize to clients and really anybody that I talk to, which is the importance of bio-individuality, 
the importance of, you know, all of our bodies are different. And you're right, like this kind of cookie cutter, everybody do the Atkins, everybody do keto, everybody do vegan, everybody do it. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's, yeah. it's, it's just, and especially with, with genetics and understanding like you're 23 and me or whatever genetics reports you get. I mean, you see it right there, you know, it's like, Absolutely. we all, we all have genes that encode for different things. Yeah. And, and why we think we all should eat the same way. It's beyond me. I mean, we, we all have different genes which code for different eye colors and hair colors. And we fully understand that. We even understand how genetically some of us are at risk for say Parkinson's because our father may have had it or something along that line. But we've had this dogma in our society for so long that diet is either calories in or calories out, or there should just be one type of diet that all of us humans should be eating. Not so at all. And genetics has proven that. And that's what I'm so excited about. And Weight Watchers is still open somehow. Yes, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's crazy. Like when you talk to people uh, and this, like, like what we're talking about today, it, it's so beyond, I think what so many people can grasp, you know, because they are, they're stuck in this calories in calories out. And I still hear it, you know, there's people still out there counting points, you know, they're like, I can't eat, uh, you know, this steak or whatever because it's too many points and it's like well you don't even know maybe your body has the gene that actually wants the steak wants that steak that's exactly right and you know one of the very difficult things is is that we get caught in one what we like to do so you know when dr atkins diet came out after the sort of very low fat high carb diet we're, we're naturally very lazy as humans. It was like, oh my God, fantastic. You want me to eat fat? Okay, I'll do that. And then it went into this, you know, eat every three hours or every two seconds, as I like to call it. Great. Every time you're hungry, just eat. That's like saying to the alcoholic, every time you want a glass of wine, just have a sip. Like our bodies don't run that way. And when you take anybody who has been eating a, a fairly average North American diet, which let's face it, that's not very healthy, and you suddenly clean up their diet independent of what it is. So we pull out the white refined sugars, we pull out some of the saturated fats, et cetera. They're going to lose weight. And then they get on this, oh, well, this must be it. But then they're, they're going to hit that plateau. And you talk to anybody who has struggled with weight, they know that plateau. And no matter what they do, they just can't get past it. And again, this is where when you cater somebody's diet genetically to how they are supposed to eat, they never hit that plateau because you are doing exactly what your body wants you to do. Great example that we were just chatting about. There's a gene called APO2 or APOA2. And what this gene does is it talks about how much saturated fat you actually absorb when you eat it through your intestines. So some people, they'll absorb more than the normal amount of, say, saturated fat from that steak that you were talking about, say 70% of the fat from that steak, while others will only absorb about 50% from the exact same size piece of steak. So the people who are absorbing more than the normal amount of saturated fat, they actually have to eat less saturated fat because otherwise they're going to be consuming and absorbing too much of that fat, and that goes into stimulating uh, a dip, uh, like adipose tissue or fat tissue. The other thing that that gene will do is when they eat more than the normal amount of saturated fat, which is easy for those people to do because they absorb more than the normal amount, it also triggers a hormone from the stomach called ghrelin. And that's the hormone that makes us hungry. It's really not always dependent upon what we've just eaten. It's actually a brain message. So that ghrelin hormone will make us seek out more food, back to that fridge, back to that fridge. So you have to fight both satiety and hunger simply because of that one gene. So that individual, they actually need to stick to less than 22 grams of saturated fat per day, not to trigger that gene into absorbing so much saturated fat, increasing weight gain, increasing cholesterol, and increasing that, that hormone ghrelin. 22 grams saturated fat is not that high. So for instance, let's look at that Bulletproof diet, one of those diets that's been around you know, in the press a lot. One ounce of coconut oil is 16 grams of saturated fat. One tablespoon of butter is almost eight grams of saturated fat. So that one Bulletproof coffee in the morning has flipped those individuals 
over the 22 grams of, that they are allotted for the entire day. So what that means is that coffee in the morning turned on the expression of that gene so that any saturated fat that they eat or, or any food that they eat for the rest of the day, they are now highly absorbing and storing it as fat and triggering that hunger hormone all day long. Somebody who codes the opposite for it, they're actually catered for the bulletproof diet. So this is where we see that individuality. Right. Yeah. Especially with something like saturated fat, because that's such a, that's such a hot button. Um, and you know, like we've come from this place that it's like for years we were told something like fat, don't eat fat, fat makes you fat. Right. Um, but then, you know, I mean, as much as I, I, I would like to crit, I, I love to criticize the Bulletproof Diet and Dave Asprey. Um, I think he opened up a can of worms yep. that we're just starting to kind of understand, or at least he's brought it mainstream, which is the idea that, like you said, some people do, some people can. Some people do absolutely great on saturated fat. And biologically, it has a lot of purposes. Yep. Um, but like you said, some people look at their friend who lost 30 pounds doing the bulletproof diet, they got ripped, they feel great, and then they did it and just completely failed. Exactly. And they'll be, they'll be inflamed. Another great one that we love to sort of target is protein. So, you know, the more protein, the better, the more satisfied we're going to be, the more weight we're going to lose. And there's, there's a gene called FTO, and this is one of the major metabolic genes. And it does determine how much, again, uh, storage of fat and food cravings. But one of the other things it does talk about is how much protein per meal an individual will need. And the people who code perfectly for that gene, for the FTO gene, they actually have the fastest metabolisms but they need the smallest amount of protein out of any of the, the genetic groups for that gene. And if they actually eat the amount of protein that the, the variants or the mutations for that gene will, who need the highest amount of protein, they will be extremely inflamed. Mm -hmm. So for instance, a great example is I, I'm a gym rat, so I see this in the gym all the time. Everyone's downing protein shakes before, during, after, left, right, center, and they think it's really great. And you see these really big buff guys, and yes, they've got a lot of muscle, but they have this whole layer of inflammation over top of them. Their face is red. Their skin is red. And you just know that they are the ones with the fast metabolism, but they are just plying themselves full of protein and inflaming the body, which is actually going to age it much more quickly. Um, I actually have the reverse. I have the very slow metabolism there. So I actually need the higher amount of protein. So I actually need more protein often than some of those big buffed guys do. Right. Um, and if I eat less, I'm not going to be satisfied and my metabolism won't stay high. So, um, so, so just to catch the, uh, catch the a-hole listening passively at home, mm -hmm. what, we're, what we're actually talking about here is um, SNPs, right? Single nucleotide polymorphisms. Because... I mean, I don't know how many genes there are. Is there thousands? More? Thousands and thousands and thousands. But one of the really big key things to know, not all of them, most of them are not relevant. So when you get back your 23andMe or, and you upload it into some of these decoders, they spit out pages and pages and pages of genes and, and often five or six different versions of a same name of a gene. Most of them are irrelevant, but what people get caught up in is, oh my God, I'm red, which means variant or coding in, a, in an adverse way for all of these really important genes. They might be green for one of them, meaning coding well, and that's the only one clinically relevant gene. So mm -hmm. yes, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of genes, but very few of them are clinically relevant. There's probably about 500 extremely clinically relevant genes that we use therapeutically. So do you think those non-clinically relevant genes, was that just like a part of our evolution somehow? Like those, those we needed them at one point, but now we don't need them anymore? I think there's some with that. And then I also think that we're going to start to discover more about those irrelevant genes. So um, in genetics, and this is going way back, there's, there's parts of a chromosome, um, which we used to call an exon, which is a, a part that we would never pay attention to. Um, we used to think it was, we actually would call it garbage DNA. We now know that it actually does encode for some extremely important uh, 
uh, functions within the body. So I think as our knowledge base starts to grow, we will see more and more um, developments within our knowledge base. And we might find that some of what we consider a junk DNA right now might actually not be junk. Um, but we do know that we have repeatable science behind those SNPs that we do use and that we are treating over and over and over that when a person has this and they're expressing a gene, which is another important part, they will create this characteristic. So every gene has like an on and an off position. And so my job as a clinician is to look at how a patient codes for a gene and say, this is fantastic. I want to keep it turned on. And this is how we do it through this natural supplement, this amino acid, this diet, this lifestyle, or this is not so great. We want to make sure it's turned off. And this is how we turn it off. Mm. And so we, that's, that's a really important part too. When you're looking and sitting, when I'm sitting down with a patient or, or Skyping with a patient, it is, you code this way, but everything that I know about you, I don't think you're expressing that gene. So they may have a, a gene that increases the risk of cancer, but they don't have cancer at that time, which means that gene is turned off and we want to keep it turned off. And these are the ways that we do it. Or um, I fortuitously have never been obese, but I, I actually have a lot of the obesity genes, but that's because I've always had a very, I've always been very clean with my diet and exercise. So I know how to keep those turned off. I also know that when Christmas comes, it's very easy for me to put on weight if I'm not keeping those genes in those certain positions. So we all work with turning genes on and off our whole life. Um, and that's a really important part because you don't have to treat every single gene. That's so amazing. That's so like, that's so like, to understand like what that means. I think for some people that, that, that could be a game changer in their health. It is. I have never had a patient come back and not say, oh my God, I feel like myself again, but I have control over myself again. Because when you start tweaking pathways in the body on a genetic level, it is amazing all the various changes that occur. For instance, you're eating the right amount of protein, so your metabolism is functioning better, but you also drop your inflammatory load. When you drop your inflammatory load, oh, lo and behold, your joint stiffness starts to decrease, and all these little cascades start coming off of it. And the best thing is, is you don't hit those plateaus mm -hmm. because it's not just a calorie in, calorie out, or cleaning things up. Well, so I wanted to ask you about um, something like curcumin uh -huh. because um, I, I think I remember from that workshop, you know, some people have this ability to process curcumin and then maybe to some people it might be more toxic or yeah. might be more bad. Um, but in the mainstream, it's like the hot thing now is turmeric, right? Exactly. And everybody's gonna have their turmeric and there's turmeric powders. And, uh, and I, I personally like the, the fresh like root stuff. But again, I don't even know. I don't even know exactly. if I should be having it, right? So it's well, it's it's very individual, just like everything. So this comes from a gene called CYP1A2, and this is a phase one detoxification gene. So detoxification has two two pathways in the body: it has phase one and phase two. Phase one is where our body identifies a toxin inside of a cell, and it can't get outside of the cell in its original shape. So these CYP uh, genes or these liver, or sorry, CYP enzymes, these liver enzymes from this gene, they can identify that toxin inside of the cell. Then they change the shape of that toxin and they bring that toxin to the outside of the cell. So they present it to the rest of the system. And then phase two is where our body recognizes that chain shaped substrate on, on the outside of the cell, binds to it and clears it out. When we make a phase one substrate, so when we take that toxin and change the shape and bring it to the outside of the cell, invariably we change it to a precarcinogenic, more inflammatory substrate. So not so good. It's okay though if phase two, the rate of phase two matches the rate of phase one. So we bind onto it and take it out. So with the CYP1A2 gene, some people make more or the highest level of these enzymes that then take these toxins and take them to the outside cell. So they are making a ton of these inflammatory precarcinogenic substrates and often not just to toxins, but they'll start doing it to benign substrates as well. Mm. Curcumin slows down that enzyme. So what it, if somebody codes too quickly for that gene, 
curcumin is perfect because it helps to slow it down. So they're not going to start to target the benign substrates. They're really only going to target the real toxins that need to do it. However, opposite end of the spectrum, if somebody codes very slowly or what we call variant for that gene, they already don't have enough enzyme to say, get this toxin out. You're loading them up of curcumin and you're slowing down the production of that enzyme again and then the action of taking the, the toxins outside of the cell. So they will actually increase their production of inflammation by taking the turmeric or the curcumin. That's crazy. You, you just put like 30 people out of business by yeah, saying sorry. that. Sorry, <laughs> it's wonderful for people like me. I go too high, so it's fantastic. It's um, the same gene also talks, but we also call this gene the caffeine gene because caffeine slows down this gene. So for me, who I overcode and I'm too fast, I'm really good with a curcumin. I'm also really good with two to three cups of coffee a day. In fact, I'm better with two to three cups of coffee a day than none. It'll actually decrease inflammation within my cardiovascular system so much that it decreases my risk of having a heart attack by almost 50%. Wow. People who are really slow, caffeine's not so good for them. Another really important part of this gene, cruciferous vegetables. So those, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the bok choy, the kale, all those fantastic uh, uh, vegetables, they speed up this gene when, when we consume them in a raw status. So I can't consume them in a raw. I have to cook them a little bit because, again, my gene's already too fast. I, I'm not a candidate for juicing. And that's the naturopath 10 years ago. That's, you know, that's what I was supposed to do. And I would feel horrible. I would just, I'd be hellish. I'm thinking, wow, I must have a lot of toxins in me that I'm trying to get out. Now I realize I was just speeding up my inflammation and then not carrying it out. So anyone who coats high, they need to cook all their cruciferous vegetables. Opposite end of the spectrum, they want to eat them raw. So when you say you code too high or you code too slow, let's say I'm looking, uh, I went and did a 23andMe and now I've got my, you know, uh, my report or whatever. And um, I don't know if they do it on the 23andMe site. I know there's sites that you can do this on. Um, and let's say, like, how do you know if you're coding too fast or too slow for something? So um, generally, it'll come up as red, yellow, or green. And the red is the variant position or the, the, the wrong position, if you will, the bad position, if you will. It means it's the position that our body has, has mutated this gene over time to. Yellow is right in the middle, and green is the best position, usually. So with the CYP1A2, the fast position is actually the green. So that's actually the not so great position. Yellow is the perfect position for that gene. For FTO, that fat obesity gene that we spoke about, um, I code red for that, so I have a double T. Um, other people who code green, they're the ones with the fastest metabolism. They need the lowest amount of protein. So it is a little bit gene specific. Um, when we talk about coding, there's, there's potentially three main positions for, for each gene, for most genes. There are some exceptions there because we take one chromosome from our, from our mom and one from our dad. So if we take two of the original or normal or good chromosomes, we call that homozygote normal. So they have two good ones. That's a green green. If we take one good one and one, let's call it bad one or variant. So we have one of each. That's called heterozygote. If they take one of the two, uh, like one bad from each parent, that's called homozygote variant. And that's the red position. Mm -hmm. So the heterozygote would be the yellow. Um, and most often, red meets, means the not good position, but there are a few exceptions with that too. So um, is there a way, uh, you know, because we're talking about turning genes on and off, is there a way that your uh, coding or position can change over time? No. No, your position will always be the same. It's a really great question. So you will always code, let's say if it was FTO, you'll always code AT. That's the heterozygote position. Um, we want to express the T allele, not the A allele. So whether you are expressing a gene or not, whether that gene is turned on or off, will that's what we manipulate. But you will always code the same way. It's like a light switch will always look the same, but whether the light switch is turned on or off, it's up or down. Right. 
Yeah. I thought it was funny how you were just talking about like the juice fast thing. And, you know, because like the big thing is like, like detox, right? Like everybody wants to do a Mm. detox. And I know this plays a lot into detox, especially when it comes to things like, you know, methylation and sulfur and these different, you know, phase one, phase two pathways. And it's like, I always, like I I tell people now, because now I kind of understand it where detox isn't as simple as just detox, right? It's like, if you you could phase one detox all day, right? You could you could get those molecules to to I guess what do they do? Detox or scrub or whatever. So so the phase one take that toxin from inside the cell and bring it to the outside. Yep. But, but unless then, you have that phase two to take it out of the body, exactly. you're actually putting yourself in a worse state. Exactly. And that's the problem I would say probably most people have is they, they don't have the, the setup physically to, to get that stuff out. So it's kind of like, to me, it's like a snow globe. It's like you, You're exactly you, right. you put pe- you put that stuff in, whether it's the juice fast, whether it's the curcumin, whatever it is, you're detoxing, but you're basically shaking all of the toxins up in your body. And now they've just gone crazy all over again. That's so exactly like, right. Yeah, All of the older school detoxes were mostly phase one detoxifications, which is also when I, why when I used to do them, I would feel so horrible. The newer versions of detoxification is really focusing on phase two. Like, let's get that crap out of the body. Um, and if somebody is not aware of their genetics, you're always safe with increasing phase two. Clear, clear, clear. Phase one, you have to be very careful with. Ideally, you, wanna, you need to match them both. Um, but the, the good responsible detoxifications now are all dealing with phase two. So those are things like glutathione and resveratrol and uh, N-acetylcysteine, things that bind to those toxins and pull them out. Would you, um, because N-acetylcysteine is the precursor to glutathione, would you, if you were like, if you had the gene set up, and I don't, which gene is that that you? So know? there's a, there's a couple of those phase two ones. There's a, there's yeah. a bunch of GST or glutathione uh, genes like GSTP1, GSTM1. Um, there's there's a whole pile of them, SOD2 and QO1, and they all deal with different parts of of glutathione or free radical scavengers and, and clearing them out. So you're exactly right. NAC or N-acetylcysteine is the precursor to glutathione. But we are, and acetylcysteine is used in so many different places in the body, not just in glutathione. So if you just give just NAC, often it goes to all of its other functions first and not glutathione. Mm. If you just give glutathione and you have to give it in a proper form for it to be absorbed and you don't give it with NAC, the body often needs NAC so much that it'll actually break apart the glutathione to get the NAC, use that in all the other areas in the body and then we're still not getting the detoxification. So the best way around that is always give NAC and glutathione together, and it'll go into maximal phase two production. Yeah, that's very important. Um, because I mean, I'll, I'll go to a friend's place or something, and they got the glutathione, they're rocking, you know, but they're like, like, I don't know if it's working for me. And it's exactly. like, well, there could be a couple of reasons. You might not have the genes for it, and you need NAC to make it Exactly, work. you're exactly right. Versa. That's so, yeah, it, it, it just cracks me up like how people, oh, I'm going to do the, the master cleanse or I'm going to do the yeah. juice fast and it's, or the bone broth fast, whatever it is. And it's like, how come I feel worse? And it's because you're just not, you're not built for it or you're just not doing it right. Yeah. And we see the same thing with exercise. You know, yep. we see one person go into a high intensity interval training. They feel fantastic. They're losing weight. They're, they're getting ripped. And then we see the next person right beside them, they're actually getting inflamed and actually increasing their weight from the same exercise. And, you know, exercise is just as unique to each person as our diet is, as methylation is, as detoxification is. And there's some fantastic genes here which tell us, okay, there's one called actin-3. It it codes for the production of actin, which is a protein in the muscle which increases the production of fast-twitch muscles, which are those sprinter muscles. So somebody who has, who codes normally for this gene, homozygote normal, they have a lot of actin, they're great sprinters. Someone like myself who codes the opposite, very little actin, I'm designed for endurance running, which is what I do. But you can't just isolate that one gene and say, boom, you're a sprinter. Because just because you have the protein to make the muscle fiber, we also have to look at, do you oxygenate your muscles well? Do you increase mitochondrial output to provide energy to sprint, et cetera? So you have to do a combination 
of those. And there are different genes which we'll talk about. So NOS3 is the production of nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. It opens up the arteries when we exercise so that we can start to circulate around the, the oxygen. If you're a sprinter through actin-3, but you code very poorly and don't make a lot of nitric oxide through your NOS3 gene, you can't oxygenate well during that sprint. So now you've got to moderate your sprints a little bit. So you're not the true hit person, but you need to do interval training, but longer, slower intervals with longer, faster recoveries, not the 30 seconds full out to the full stop. Similarly, weight training. Um, in SIG2, this is the gene which talks about how, how you should weight train. So if you code normally for this gene, you are the traditional weight lifter of six to eight repetitions with heavy weights where you are starting to burn and, and struggle in like rep six, seven, and eight. If you're variant for it, you need the exact opposite. You need like 17 to 20 reps making it almost into a cardiovascular workout with a really light weight. If you take the person who needs the 17 to 20 repetitions and you put them on the six to eight repetitions with heavy weights, not only are they not going to see the gains in their muscles, but they're actually going to increase six to eight percent fat around that muscle just by doing that exercise. You're actually gaining weight from doing that exercise. Wow. Yeah. And I see these guys in the gym all the time. It's like they've got the, they're bulky. Yep. They've got the muffin top. Um, you know, they got some of the man uh, cleavage going on uh, and they're strong, but they're, they're not ripped. And so, exactly. you, so, so we're talking about how do we get ripped in the gym, right? Exactly. Yeah. So for some of us, it's like six to eight. If, if we have the NSIG2 gene, on if, the green? Yes, if you, if you, exactly, on the green. You want the six to eight repetitions with heavy weights where you're sort of struggling on those last few. And then you take a break and you rest and you rest that muscle. And it's almost like a hit style with weight. The opposite, it's 16 to 17 to 18 repetitions, even up to 20, lightweight to where rather than struggling to actually push that weight, it's burning almost like an endurance cardio, no rest right into an opposite muscle. Mm. Um, so tricep to bicep or chest to back, something like that, and keep rotating it. So you're making it almost like an endurance workout. And what is actually happening to the muscle there or the fat around it? Is the, it, it because we're, we're talking about if you're doing the wrong one, the fat could actually grow. Yeah. It, what is feeding the fat cell or tissue? So the eye in in INSIC stands for insulin. So this is a gene that triggers insulin via the wrong or right type of exercise. So it alters your insulin sensitivity to the fat over top of that muscle that you're working out. So you could trigger insulin by lifting weights. You got it. Nobody's talking about this. No, Nobody's I know. talking about this. But, you, but we see it physically. I mean, you see it in the gym all the time. Yeah, because I mean, I insulin is a tricky one, right? Because I've even heard that you can trigger insulin, and this doesn't have to do with weightlifting, but you can trigger insulin even with like stevia, which I which isn't supposed to happen, but I've heard for some people you can th that happens, or like xylitol, one of these like artificial natural sweeteners or whatever. Exactly. So that's actually done through the taste buds, um, and so there's there's a there's another gene called um, SL2 SLC2A2. And this is about glucose sensing in the body. Um, it's not the transportation of, of glucose through it, it's the sensing of it. So when we eat something really sweet, our pancreas and our liver, they get all excited. They're like, oh my God, how much sugar did I just eat? So sh how much insulin should I just make? And they can actually do that according to what they taste or sense, not just physically the sugar that's in the blood. So those people who code adversely or red for that gene, they will get triggered because stevia and, and xylitol, they're two to 300 times as sweet as regular sugars, um, the, the potent versions, they will actually treat that and trigger that insulin response. The greens in the SLC2A2s very, very rarely do that. Um, but it's, so, so it's, it, again, Everything is individual. Right. Yeah, because it's like, you know, you go do a CrossFit class and you're like, I'm going to take my, my stevia sweetened protein powder 
and you down that bad boy, you go in, you start just ripping for an hour of just, you know, six to eight uh, shoulder press, and then you're doing squats, and you're doing all this, and you're like, how come I'm still chunky? (laughs) Well, exactly. And then don't forget, there's cortisol. So our main stress hormone will also triple the release of insulin to all grains, starches, sweets, fruits, sugars, or sweeteners, and alcohol, independent of where our genetics code. But if we're doing the wrong kind of exercise, that's a physical stressor on the body. So now we're making cortisol as well at an abnormal rate from our exercise, which is then just augmenting this whole insulin response. Then we also have a whole pile of adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol genes as well. Some people naturally make more than the normal amount of stress hormone for each stressor. So those are the ones, again, that they are just going to uh, augment the amount of cortisol on a daily basis, which then also triples that insulin release. So these, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, that's okay. Go ahead. I was going to say, so, so these folks who, who make more cortisol, um, does that have any mental effects on these people? These are the panic attack people. These are the uh, post-traumatic stress disorder people. These are the, uh, again, uh, obese people, independent, uh, a lot of the times, independent of what they're eating or you see the weight gain. Afterwards, we see a lot of bowel disorder because cortisol creates a a great deal of havoc. That's a whole other podcast in the GI track. Uh, These are the people who, poor sleeping habits, so waking at two to four in the morning, classic for high cortisol. Um, And it all starts to cycle around from there. They're not sleeping properly. They're not going into stage four sleep, which is the good deep sleep because cortisol is inhibiting that. They're tired the next day. So what do we do? We eat poorly. We're looking for more sugars because we're so tired. That then triggers a higher insulin response. That higher insulin response is a physical stressor, which makes more cortisol and it all goes around. Right. So if you were looking at somebody like this who, you know, they they produce all this cortisol, What is probably your number one treatment? Um, So there I use a a supplement called Serenitin Plus. Um, This is a very specific protein sequence that is 10 amino acids long and a green tea extract called theanine. But it's actually the protein sequence that's more important. What it will do is it will bind directly to the adrenal glands and start to decrease the excess release of cortisol, adrenaline, and noradrenaline literally within 24 hours. People, People on this start to feel... (sighs) <sighs> not sedated, not groggy, just really coming down. Um, but the more important thing that it does is it actually binds and resets receptors in the brain on two different glands. One's called the hypothalamus and one is called the pituitary. Mm-hmm. And those are the glands where these genes are active. Those are the glands that are keep saying, tell my adrenals, my stress glands to keep making these stress hormones. So but with this one uh, very, a very natural supplement, we are targeting both the stimulant to say, make more stress hormone, as well as the actual production of it out of that gland. And that is what takes people from the stress side of their nervous system to the not stress side, the parasympathetic side. Mm -hmm. So, which brings me in, I guess, to the next question is digestion um, with these these, uh, gene variants. you know, because if you're, if you're able to calm down your adrenals and you can get yourself into sympathetic, parasympathetic, would you then couple that up with something to treat maybe something like stomach acid or gallbladder function? Absolutely. So specifically when, when we look at digestion, there's, there's a couple of great genes. There's genes that talk about, um, do you actually allow your, your microbiome, your good bacteria in your gut to flourish and grow and replicate. There's some genes when they're in the variant position, they actually start to kill all the good bacteria that's in our gut. And those good bacteria we now know are responsible for triggering a lot of the inflammatory response, but they're also responsible for increasing the production of stress hormones. So we need to make sure that that microbiome or that gut flora is, is really good. People who are uh, variant in those certain genes they need a higher daily dose of probiotics than say somebody else would. When, when we're in the stress side, uh, our, the sympathetic side of our central nervous system, we make 20,000 fold less digestive enzymes. So just by using that serenitin plus and getting people back to the parasympathetic side, you've already said, here's the enzymes to break my food down. But there are also different genes which talk about, do you maximally make 
uh, a full dose of digestive enzymes, and what kind. So this is where it gets into, should you be vegan? Should you not be vegan? You know, how much enzyme do you have to break down meat versus nuts versus vegetables, etc.? And then there's also different uh, genes which talk about how quickly the immune system will identify a bad bacteria or a pathogen in the skin or in the gut. And people who are variant for this gene, their immune system is really slow there. So when, we have, when we're exposed to a bad bacteria, it starts to replicate really quickly in that person and they can't fight it off. Um, and then they set themselves up for a, a lot of different GI disorders. People who code normally for that, they have a much more resilient gut. So would you do uh, any kind of microbiome testing then to, to check this? So the microbiome testing is fantastic. Uh, again, it's a growing field. Um, one of the very difficult things with that is that it'll come out saying you're really low in these four different um, strains. We don't have the supplements yet to target those four different strains. We, don't, we haven't designed those yet. We have a lot of different probiotics with a lot of different strains, but, and some of them that comes back, if it comes back with some of the, the Ramnos, the Acidophilus bifidus, the Bifidobacterium, um, any of those guys, yes, we have those probiotics. But to target those really specific ones, which a lot of this microbiome testing is doing, we don't have the technology for the treatment yet. So I'm not jumping into that just yet, because that's like saying to someone, you have this awful diagnosis, now I got nothing to help you. I don't want to do that to a patient. So I'm taking my basis with the genetics. Do you allow things to grow? Do you not? Where's your bacterial status, et cetera? And we know that what creates a healthy microbiome, at least to date, to date this is what we know, is microbial diversity. So I'm not just going to throw one or two strains at them at first. I'm going to throw a pile of strains at them at first. And then the bigger part is to get them to seed in there and replicate, you have to feed them uh, like a miracle grow. And with that, we need a prebiotic, which are those FOS type fibers, the GOS type fibers, um, or different foods. Again, the cruciferous vegetables, different legumes, they will actually act as the nutrients to then take that probiotic that we just ingested and say, replicate and stay there. So, okay, and I guess that's my next question is, you know, when it comes to something like probiotics, um, are you also using like fermented foods, um, mm -hmm. you know, the sauerkrauts, the kimchi, kombucha? Absolutely. Um, or is that also, could, could you also uh, put that under, do you have the right genes to even break this down in the first place? You're exactly right on all variables. So I, even when it comes to treatment with genetics, I still, there still is no cookie cutter. So um, somebody might need a more of a diversity than is in say a kefir, uh, which is mostly just the acidophilus bifidus bifidobacterium. They may need more of, of some of the other species, which you will get in a kimchi, but they also may be really, really bad with carbohydrate breakdown. Um, and if they're bad with carbohydrate breakdown, I can't use the, the kimchi and the cabbages. Or if, if they have to overly cook the cabbage, which is a cruciferous vegetable, because of their detoxification gene, you're going to kill a lot of the probiotics there. So then I might need to go to a supplement form. Um, and then there is also how willing my patient is to take a pill versus a food. Um, and, and everybody's individual there as well. Yeah, because there, because I'm so split on probiotics, you know, because there's, it, it seems like on one hand, the idea of getting what, 4 billion, is it CTUs or, or, or 50 billion or whatever it is? I mean, it, it feels like to me a thing that it's like, we haven't figured out the gut yet. <laughs> right. No, you're and, right. And so it's almost like, well, we've got this thing that's just going to add a lot more gut stuff to a thing that we don't really get yet. And I've even heard that, that probiotics uh, are, are taken down by your stomach acid in the first place. So depending on the coating. Um, so that's, that's where some of the supplements come in because they'll actually have a, uh, a liposomal or a polysaccharide coating around it, which will only break down in, in the large intestine, some of them, and at the very end around the ileocecal valve uh, or just prior to the ileocecal valve in the small intestine. So they're going to get target deliveries there. Um, in the cheaper versions, they don't have that. In the food, they don't have that. Um, so it, 
that that does actually make a, a huge difference. I'm always going to try to go food when I can go food. Um, but uh, Toronto is a very similar to New York and people are like, they just want fast. They want now they want it easy. Yep. Um, so often a pill is easier for, for them. Sure. You can't always just carry around sauerkraut with you. I guess. Exactly. <laughs> Delicious, but it doesn't go well in your backpack. Exactly. Um, now, I, I wanted to ask you, because this is a, a nutrient that I, I have such a hard time with, because I was a vegan for a little while, and uh, I don't want to say it didn't work out. I actually enjoyed being a vegan. Um, I found a lot of good to it. It helped me become a better cook, helped me appreciate plants a lot more. Um, but now that I'm not vegan, I, I, feel, I feel good. I don't know why. But one thing I was always curious about is, is B12. Uh, cause I don't really know, I, I've never really give, been given like a straight answer as to what B12 is or does. And I would imagine there's probably a, uh, probably a gene variant that codes for it working a certain way. Cause if, I feel like it does a number of things, but not You're just exactly one thing right. specifically. So B12 goes into the production of a lot of different hormones, a lot of different enzymes. But one of the biggest things that it does is it's involved in methylation. So methylation is essentially like a catalyst for most activities in the body. We need to methylate in order to produce a protein to make an enzyme to make any reaction go, whether it's production of a hormone, an antibody, uh, breakdown of a hormone, etc. So there's about eight different really clinically relevant uh, methylation genes. And there's a bunch of them that deal with B12. So FOOT2 is one of them which deals with the absorption of B12. So when you, uh, and, and we see this, we see people taking uh, B12 really well and their, their levels don't go up. And those are the people that need the, the injections because they just don't absorb it through their gut. Um, then there is the degradation of B12, the recycling of B12, and then taking that B12 from the blood to the target tissue. And those are genes like MTR, MTRR, et cetera. So there's a bunch of them and they all deal with how B12 is absorbed, moved around the body and used in the body. If you are variant in one of those steps, particularly the absorption of B12, that's a big one, um, or, or it's degradation of B12, your levels are gonna be significantly lower and your methylation overall is going to be extremely poor. So you might have a fantastic, let's say, coding for the production of serotonin in through your genes, but if you can't methylate or you can't absorb B12, you can't make that serotonin. So sometimes we don't need to give the antidepressant, we just need to actually get the methylating. And this is where B12 comes in. Now B12 has many different forms as well. We see cyanocobalamin, cobalamin is B12, or methylcobalamin or adenosylcobalamin. Um, the best used form in the body is actually a combination of adenosyl and cyanocobalamin, uh, or sorry, adenosyl and hydroxycobalamin. Because adenosyl cobalamin will push itself into methyl B12 on an as needed basis. Sometimes if you give somebody just straight methyl B12, it actually speeds up the methylation a little bit too quickly and they can feel a little bit too stimulated because it'll also go into making adrenaline and noradrenaline and things like that. But if you give them the adenosyl hydroxy B12, that combo, it'll push into methyl B12 on an as needed base and the rest will stay as adenosyl hydroxy used in other areas of the body. So it's the safest, easiest way to, to use B12. So if somebody is, I guess, deficient in B12, maybe because they're not able to methylate, mm -hmm. um, how does that present itself? So you will see a lot of, a, a lot of um, mental, emotional disorders. You see some depression. You will see some uh, anxiety. You'll see different cardiovascular effects. Because when, over, when one part of the methylation cycle is impaired, It'll impair, it'll block the whole methylation cycle. So other parts of methylation deal with folic acid, which then takes a lot of our cardiovascular things like homocysteine and clears it out of the body, which is a, a cardiovascular stroke marker. So it has a big effect on Alzheimer's, dementia, depression, anxiety, and cardiovascular health. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot for a little vitamin. Yeah. That and and so do you think then it's a thing that you can only get through animal products? Because that's what I've heard survives the digestion process, or is it a thing that you can actually supplement? 
oh no, you can supplement with, absolutely. And those that are variant for that absorption gene, they need to take a whole lot more or move to, to a, um, an injection, but you can still do it by fixing the whole methylation cycle and just doing a slightly higher dose of B12. So you want to increase your methylation and increase B12. Exactly. And so this is why, you know, when, when people say, oh, that dose of a vitamin is too high for a person. Well, genetics are showing us individuality again. So if, if somebody only absorbs 50% of their vitamin D, they need a higher dose just to absorb the same amount that somebody who's absorbing 100% of it. It's exactly like the saturated fat with the steak. So you really have to look at, there is no RDA dose. There is no safe dose, if you will, um, safe within words of a certain vitamin or mineral because some people absorb it all, some people absorb very little. The ones who absorb very little, they need to intake a higher dose of it. That's so interesting because again, it's a thing that's totally oversimplified and you know, yep. we just don't, we, everyone's different. <laughs> Everybody's different. Um, one, one thing I wanted to ask you about too, uh, I was uh, on your website and you have some really interesting blog posts uh, there. I totally recommend people check it out. It's a, pkrhealth.ca mm -hmm. yes you canadians uh, uh, i know <laughs> <laughs> you're like we don't want the dot com we got the dot ca <laughs> um you were uh, i read this article that you wrote about uh food addiction mm -hmm. which um which now that we've been chatting for a little bit seems to play into this like idea of um maybe like, are you absorbing saturated fat? Do you absorb these certain nutrients? Because I would imagine that plays into like meeting a nutrient profile and ghrelin and leptin are going crazy. So you got it. Absolutely. So the food addiction part, really good gene for that is our dopamine genes, a big one called DRD2. So this is the production of dopamine uh, and the binding of dopamine into the receptor. Dopamine is our addictive chemical messenger. It is our motivating chemical messenger. It's our uh, at the end of the day. And when somebody is addicted to anything, whether it is alcohol or food or, or anything, we always have a dopamine deficiency here. Um, so the people who are more predisposed to that are the people who have a low and naturally low dopamine production through those genes. Then if you combo it with a poor absorption where they're not going to be absorbing tyrosine, which is an amino acid which is needed to make dopamine from their protein sources, or they're not methylating properly so they can't make dopamine, um, or their detoxification, their phase two genes are too fast and they're clearing out dopamine too quickly. Um, like there's a lot of different sides to it. They're more susceptible to it. Different genes also show us who makes more than the normal amount of hormone to exercise. So I'm somebody that I make, a, I make very little dopamine naturally. So I am always looking for a, a high. Um, fortuitously, it's never been a drug or an alcohol high. It could have been. Mine's always been exercise. So I get a really good high from it. I have to start my day that way. It, it sets me off differently. But when I'm exercising, I'm the girl that's looking for, let's say if I'm skiing, that cliff to go jumping off of. I don't want to die. I want to make sure there's snow down there, but I want that high of it. If I'm hiking, I want to go up the highest mountain. I want to rappel off of it. We think of them as adrenaline highs. They're actually dopamine highs. And I want those hits frequently. And uh, it's no different than the alcoholic who wants that hit frequently because alcohol releases dopamine um, or, or gambling or sex. It, it's your drug of choice, if you will. And when somebody doesn't code, when somebody codes very low for dopamine production, they need continual hits to keep that dopamine high because each hit gives them a little bit. Or they can take tyrosine. Um, on, on a daily basis and give them the precursors to it. Again, if I can do it through a lifestyle way for myself exercise, right, I don't need to take the tyrosine and I can keep myself there. So how much, uh, so, so I mean, if you know you're an addictive personality, I don't even think you would need a genetics test to be able to tell that. No, like, you, know. You, know, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. It's like I work out in the morning, I have to. If I don't, I feel bad. Yeah, <laughs> uh, exactly. I have my own addictions. I would say probably for a lot of people, things like social media uh, probably Absolutely. hits that a lot. Absolutely. Anything where that 
thought process is controlling the person, that's going to be an addiction. Yeah. And so you're saying tyrosine is tyrosine. a good... Tyrosine is an amino acid, which increases the production of dopamine. Um, there's also another great product called Dopa Plus, which has tyrosine in it. It also has a little bit of L-dopa in it. It also has some of the, the, the B12 and the folic acid so that we can go into making, methylating it as well. Um, so there's a lot of different routes that you can use for that. And if you're, if you're talking about, I, I want to increase my methylation, what, what's a good thing to take for that? But overall methylation, if I don't know somebody's genes specifically, um, there's something I'll use called pure genomics multivitamin. So it's actually a multivitamin that was made by for, specifically for genetics with, with methylation and, and other things in mind because it has a thousand micrograms of methylfolate. So to, to, to target those two big methylation genes, MTHFR, there's two of them. Um, and in methylfolate is its correct version. It has the, the B12 in the adenosine and the hydroxy version. And again, a thousand micrograms. So not wickedly high doses, but enough to start to get somebody methylating. If somebody is, ver is, is variant in a lot of them, they might want to add on some extra methylfolate or, or B12. Um, but just even one, if not two of those multivitamins per day, amazing in terms of upgrading that methylation. Yeah. I mean, I, I would be intrigued to see, like, I don't know if there's been a, a, any studies done on this, but, you know, if you took like a group of like compulsive gamblers or alcoholics and then, you know, you, you controlled them out and you were like tyrosine and even maybe this pure genomics, multi, like what would happen if they could, if it would be a struggle, you know, because like that's the big thing for getting over your addictions is like, you could stop, but then you're just going to have that impulse to want to do it again. So I wonder what the actual thing feels like, you know? Exactly. So I see it in my practice all the time. Um, so I'm sent a lot of uh, addicted patients that work very close to, to an addictive clinic, an addiction clinic. And um, I see it all the time over and over. The, the decrease in the desire for that addictive behavior, which is very different than mentally controlling it. They get to a place where they just stop thinking about it, um, about doing that versus just using sheer willpower. And most often what we see with addictions is it's fantastic. Somebody will go through a 12-step uh, program. They'll stop drinking. But unless they fix that dopamine, they just shove it over to another type of addiction. They start eating. They start gambling. They start doing something else. Yeah. When you start targeting it, targeting at the dopamine methylation level, it's a whole other ballgame. It's like the same thing with food. It's like, you know, how do I stop overeating? Oh, well, you know, moderation is key. Just don't, you just don't eat. And you're like, I'm going crazy. All I exactly. want to do is eat. And, and again, so, so those genes for, for the hormones that control food cravings, not just dopamine, but adiponectin and leptin and that deal with all the satiety factors. Um, those people who code normally, they are the people that can go, oh, moderation, fine. I can have a bite of this. The people who are variant for those genes, no way. Try to say just have a little bit. Absolutely not. Yeah. Everything in moderation, including moderation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Crazy. Um, well, cool. Well, we've been, we've been walk, uh, talking here for, uh, for almost an hour now. Um, I don't want to hold up too much of your time, but this has been, I mean, so insightful, so informative. Um, I definitely would love to have you back to, to talk. I would love, love to do it anytime. I want to talk about every single gene. <laughs> As many interviews. We're going to have many sessions together then. <laughs> Let's talk about every gene, every variant. Um, no, so uh, I know people who are listening to this are going to get uh, going to get a lot out of that, or if they're watching or whatever. Um, but if, if you could leave the listener, the viewer, off with any parting thoughts and even a place where they can find you, any uh, programs or speaking gigs that you have coming Absolutely. up, you would like to. I think my biggest message would be: your genes are not your destiny we have the ability to alter them and, and that's really important. So our genes are the stage, they are the foundation of our health and knowing them is extremely important. But we have the ability to decide what those genes do and how to do that. So we get the power back over our, our body and that is, that's extremely exciting to me but it's also extremely empowering for the individual. Um, so I suggest everybody go out and test them. I'm often asked, you know, how can you, can I test my child? Of course, let's target those genes before they've turned in, turned themselves on or turned into to bad patterns. Um, so I, I recommend everybody go out and get them tested and 
sit down don't don't use the decoders that are out there with the very non medical uh, information go to somebody that you trust who can help you wade your way through it um, and determine exactly the program that is designed for you and it takes all the guessing game out of when you're standing in the health food store saying which of these vitamins and supplements should I should I take now you know absolutely and you were saying you're 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 writing in the a book right now do you have I, any yep. I am writing a book on all of these genes that we're talking about and how to treat them. Um, and it will be, again, the, both, for, both for doctors and lay public. There'll be two different uh, sections to it. Hoping to get it out by May, June. Awesome. Cool. So I'll have you back on and then you can push that book and we could talk some Fantastic. more about this stuff. Um, and then I think you were saying that you have a video series possibly coming out. Yeah, video series coming out on, on so sort of the, the um, lectures that you saw me give. Um, similar idea. So going through metabolic genes or exercise genes or detoxification genes and uh, how to, how, what they mean, how to interpret them and how to treat them. Awesome. So well, cool. Well, well, look out for that. Uh, A-holes, look out for Dr. Penny Kendall Reed. She's got a lot of great content coming out. Buy her books that are still on Amazon, but she doesn't have them. So you can get them. <laughs> uh, but they are good. Uh, all about holistic health, all about uh, improving your health, improving your lifestyle. Um, and check her out on pkrhealth.ca. And then uh, Dr. Penny Kendall Reed, thank you so much for your time. I certainly appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thank you.